In this episode of Film Room, we are going to break down the Miami Heat's 2-3 zone defense. They have caused some problems for teams with their zone defense this year. They're currently running it 8% of the time, giving up .853 points per possession, which would be number two overall in defensive efficiency if they played it full time. Obviously, that is not sustainable if they played it full time. According to Synergy, they are the number one zone defense team with for high usage that is over five percent now the clippers and mavericks are right there at 4.5 and 4.4 percent but we're going to look at the heat's zone defense and how they do what they do and why they do what they do my name is coach piper thank you for checking out this video if you like it please feel free to like and subscribe or just share it with your friend i hope 2020 started off well so we're going to look at the setup of the heat's 2-3 zone defense I don't want to call it a matchup zone defense, but it is very similar to other matchup zones I've seen in the past. The roles and responsibilities of the Heat's 2-3 zone defense for the top two players are to simply guard whoever has the ball and primarily the high post or the wing on a bump down. So in this scenario, the ball is in the middle of the floor, the two players in the middle of the floor, they're matched up. Uh, there is a player on the opposite wing and the slot, so Jimmy Butler is okay in that position. And then you have Duncan Robinson guarding the ball one-on-one. -on -one. Their primary role and responsibility is to take care of the ball, any dribble penetration from the top of the key to the wing, that is their role to guard. The bottom three is two wings and the big in the middle. The wings are responsible for a first wing pass until they get bumped down and then their role is to kind of take away the corner pass or anybody in the corner. That is their responsibility. The big in the middle of the floor is responsible for any paint drives, rebounding, any sort of post touches, any interior uh, high post attacks, and also to 2.9, which will break down a little bit and not getting a defensive three second call. The number one thing on a wing pass is the wing player will take it first until he gets bumped down from the player at the top. So in this scenario, Bam takes it initially and then gets bumped down by Duncan Robinson and he now is matched up on the ball. Once he is matched up on the ball, the other guard, in this case Jimmy Butler, is responsible for the high post or the top of the key if the high post is vacated. Uh, the players in the, in the bottom part of the zone the middle and the wings have to communicate that the wing here since the corner is empty can kind of pinch down on the post since they're playing Embiid the player in the middle is responsible for any players cutting through so in this scenario he takes Embiid or any player that are in the post and then the player on the weak side is responsible for any skip passes any weak side seals any weak side rebounds his number one priority is to basically clean up anything on the weak side now it's never as simple as this player automatically gets this every single time. Basketball is not that simple. Everything is dynamic and complex. The number one thing that I want to point out is the Heat just don't get screened very much in that zone. You see Jimmy Butler does a good job of avoiding both the flare screen and the ball screen. A stunt from the corner and now we're matched up in a 2-3 zone with Dragic taking the corner man. So the wing has the corner. Everybody's in the correct position. Jimmy Butler sagging in the paint. Myers Leonard has the middle position and what we're going to see here is Leonard does a good job of 2.9ing so you can't get a defensive three second call so basically get both feet out of the paint little toe touch there and then recover back to the weak side help and get a good contest in the corner. Another unique thing about the Miami Heat zone is the angles or the stances that the wing players have. They are angled with their chest towards the ball or towards half court, really exaggerating their stance. Now, this is to funnel the ball into the middle of the floor, and this is some of the things that the best 2-3 zone college teams like Washington and Syracuse do very well, is to be able to recognize where players are and have their stances in different locations to be able to funnel the ball into the middle where the help is. 
Now, one of the things that having this stance allows and, and that the heat make a priority is taking away the extra pass, especially to the corner. So what you will see is you will see them jump into passing lanes and really force the, the ball handler to make a decision and to decide whether he's going to shoot, make an extra pass. And against teams like, let's say, the Toronto Raptors, where the Raptors predicate a lot of their offense using the extra pass, it takes away a lot of their ball reversals and the ball rotations and can make the offense stagnant. A key component in the rotations of the Heat's defense is bump downs. So the ball gets on the wing and the wing player initially takes it. Then the guard in the top will then bump that player down. So in this scenario, we can see Tyler Hero initially takes the ball on the wing and then gets bumped down by Derek Jones Jr. when he rotates over. Same thing in this scenario with Jimmy Butler and Tyler Hero. Jimmy Butler is going to bump Hero down and then the defense is set. The ball gets reversed on the wing here. Initially Olenek has it and then all of a sudden Nunn comes over and pushes him down. Same thing the ball gets in the post. Wing takes it first, guard gets it, and then the wing bumps down. This allows an easy rotation and doesn't allow the heat to get beat for easy corner threes. And you can see the angles they still take, take away that extra pass. An observation that I made when studying some film of the Heat zone is when they contest shots, which they do a very good job of contesting shots, uh, they generally will have, if they're out of position, what we call flyby closeouts. And what that is is basically instead of a, a normal closeout where you would close out, chop your feet, it is just get out to the guy, contest, and fly by out of position don't worry about boxing out just contest that shot no matter what it looks to be like a priority to me at least when i watch them contest shots or at least close out the shooters and run them either off the three-point line or fly by and try to get a a contest on a three-point shot whether it's a good three-point shooter or not which is an interesting note because a lot of coaches especially at the high school level teach chop your feet close outs and, and don't be out of position the Miami Heat help off of the corner in their 2-3 zone, which makes this a little bit more unorthodox than normal. A good NBA defensive team never help out of the ball side corner. This leaves an open corner three and an easy driving kick situation, and the corner three is one of the more valuable shots in today's NBA. Now what the Heat do is they help and have good athletes that are able to recover and contest some of these shots. And here we can see an example of them stunting and recover. But what that does is it leaves a slight window for a driving kick corner three that is a high value shot. And that is one of the ways that the defense can be exposed is that open corner three. One of the actions that hurts the Miami Heat zone is a spread ball screen. This will force the player to switch from the top of the key, the top two players, in this case it's Jimmy Butler, as Joe Ingles comes off this ball screen. And then we're gonna play two on one on the weak side, forcing the wing defender to make a decision. And you can see that there is a gap open available for a drive as they come off this ball screen and we get a foul. Another example here from the Magic, here we can see we get two on the ball for the Heat. What DJ Augustine does is recognize that they're in this zone and it's gonna be a switch. He's going to find the slot. He's going to make an early pass to this slot for an easy catch and shoot three. In this clip here, we're going to see Duncan Robinson is responsible for the player coming off the ball screen. In this example, he's actually going to jump out towards Donovan Mitchell on the wing. That allows for an easy downhill jumper from Moutier in the paint with really no contest at all. The Miami Heat also go zone based on our bounds. Here we can see the top two players in the zone or the two, three zone. So the top two are gonna usually be guards. And then we see the bottom three players, which will have the big in the middle and then two wings that flatten out. And it turns into a two, three zone where basically four players are in the paint and they're eliminating any easy baskets out of baseline out of bounds opportunities, which are typically a higher efficient offensive set that teams like to run. So they get easier buckets and easier scores and based on bounds and the two, three zone that the heat runs, take them out of it. The Heat's 2-3 zone also is effective selling out of bounds, uh, as well as an end of game situations. So here you can see them running selling out of bounds. Generally speaking, 
uh, sell out of bounds, base out of bounds, end of game is where a lot of coaches will run uh, the majority of their plays because the NBA is a flow-based game. A lot of concepts are played in the half court. Um, a lot of sets are called in the, the setup situations. So having a 2-3 zone that's effective to run sell out of bounds, end of game, and base out of bounds uh, will make coaches have to prepare for extra special situations and to come up with some zone plays for end of game and things like that. NBA coaches are adept at doing those things, especially drawing up them on the spot. However, it does add an extra wrinkle of preparation that didn't have, have before if you can run an effective zone at the end of games.